to go into the act of distinguishing, and I'm going to do this quite slowly, and you'll just have to listen, because it's actually difficult. In this case, uh, what you have to do, hopefully, is to follow the movement of the language, because the movement of the language actually carries the movement of, of thinking, the movement of the idea. That's, it's designed, hopefully, to do that. Um, so it's, it's really a case of listening rather carefully. So I'm going to go into consider the act of distinguishing. When we think of this in terms of the outcome, that is in terms of what is distinguished, we cannot avoid thinking of distinction only in terms of difference. That one thing is different from another. And the movement of thinking here is one which almost automatically turns distinction into separation. So we come to think that distinction and separation are the same, but they are not. We can see that they are not the same by trying to go upstream into the act of distinction itself which means going into the happening, the coming into being, which is the appearance of distinction. Now, I say about this word appearance, um, uh, it, it becomes important, I don't know how much it will be during this week, but it becomes the most important word. And again, it's a, it's a reversing cube. The word appearance has two meanings. One, appearance, the appearance of something. Oh, uh, uh, you must take care of your appearance, what you look like. Uh, but the other is the verbal meaning, appearance. And when I write it, I do the A and C E in italics. So half the word is normal and the end of the word is italicized, appearance. So when I'm speaking, it's a bit awkward to get talking about appearance. Um, because that's the fundamental meaning in phenomenology, is a, the, the appearance, the happening of the appearing. So I tend to just call it, in, in general, the, appear, the, the appearing of the distinction. But I mean the very happening of the appearing. Again, this is all, you've got to go upstream into this, and we'll get into this. We could call this dynamical distinction the primary distinction as opposed to the secondary distinction which merely partitions and separates what has already been distinguished. So like you've got a whole load of objects and you're going to distinguish them, separate them into two groups and you say you've made a distinction. But they were there already. They were already distinguished. <coughs> when we go upstream and try to catch distinction in the act, we discover something fundamental which we overlook when we begin downstream with what is distinguished. When we shift our attention into the happening, which is the appearing of distinction, the appearing, the happening of distinction, we notice that distinction not only differences, but at the very same time, it also relates. Now, I'm going to use the word differences, I'm going to use the word difference verbally, um, I, I was okay with this because I used in various parts I used the word presence and presences and presencing, which is what Heidegger does. So I, I can do the same thing with difference. But I had a lot of trouble with an editor in America who wanted to change everything I'd written in a previous book about this. And I said, well, this is what Heidegger does. It's common knowledge. And he said to me, who the hell is Heidegger? Mm. Uh, so there we are. I realised there's a problem with an editor. Um, and he said the Chicago rules, Chicago, what they have this book, the Chicago, some of the, don't, <laughs> don't allow that Name kind of thing. Thank you. Yeah, don't allow that kind of thing. So I mean, I realised, oh my God, now what am I going to do? So I got a bit worried about difference, and I was here one day, and Charles, what was his name? Ch Nigel. Nigel, Nigel Topping. Mm. And I was saying, well, I, I want to talk about difference differences and differencing and later on in the week I'll be talking about differencing all the time and I said, I said you know I hope you're going to be alright with this 
Um, and he said, well, it's quite simple. He said, you know, you could go from dance to dancing, so you can go from difference to differencing. I said, that's it, that's great, that, that, that's me, that's it. I, I, I was so thrilled. I told him I'd mentioned that in, in the book, and I, I said, I promised him, and I've stuck to it, I've got a footnote in which refers to Nigel Topping on the MSC, Christic <laughs> Science Co- thing, because once you've made a promise, you go, that's it. Uh, people will wonder why I put it in, of course. They won't realise, well, I promised I would do it. <laughs> Be careful what you promise. <coughs> no, I'm going to. So there we go. <coughs> so when we shift our attention into the happening, which is the appearance of distinction, the actual appearing of it, we will discover that distinction not only differences, it's dynamic, you see, but at the very same time it also relates. It's when we focus only on the difference, as we do when our attention is focused on what is distinguished instead of the act itself, that we confuse distinction with separation. So now let's look into this. It gets harder now. Because I do it in a quite general kind of way. Let's see how we go. We say that A, I use words like A, B, X, not X, just general signs for things. Is that all right? We say that A is distinguished from B. Or that X is distinguished from its surroundings, which thereby become the background against which X stands out as being X. We must remember here that we are describing the very act of distinction. And so we must not fall into the trap of thinking of A and B, or of X and its surroundings, as if they were already there as such, so that the distinction would amount to no more than separating what is already distinguished, in which case we are already too late in our thinking to catch the distinction in the act. The point is, when we think about this, <coughs> we say A is distinguished from B. We sort of think of A as being there and B as just being then there. When we think of them, we actually think of them as already distinguished. So we can't catch the distinction in the act because the way we're thinking of them, they're already distinguished. We're too late. So we begin to realise here the kind of problem we have in doing this kind of work. Do not worry, it will get better. It might get worse first, but it will get better. (laughs) If A is distinguished from B, or X from not X, then the very act of distinction which differences simultaneously relates. That is, if A is distinguished from B, it is thereby concomitantly related to B by the very act of being distinguished from B. A, in other words, needs B in order to be A, because it is distinguished from B as part of what it is in its distinction. Since this relation is intrinsic to the distinction, it's part of it, and not added on afterwards, we don't get them then relate them together, the relation appears in the distinction, it is called an internal relation. This is a standard term in in philosophy, it's even now in Anglo-American philosophy, or European philosophy. It is as if the act of distinction goes in opposite directions simultaneously. Distinguishing is a dual movement of thinking, (coughs) which goes in opposite directions at once. In one direction it differences, whereas in the other direction it relates. So the act of distinction differences relates. Now, we get into it. Now, get the risks. I 
I'm going to put it this way, like this. The fact of a distinction differences slash relates. And I'll put it in the brace. We'll see why in a minute. That's what we're going to be. Act of distinction <coughs> differences relates. <coughs> if, the, uh, if the relation which is intrinsic to a distinction is not noticed, <coughs> then the distinction can only turn into separation because you've only got difference. Which is what happens when our attention shifts from the distinguishing of what is distinguished upstream to focus on what is distinguished downstream. When this happens, so a distinction is thought of only in terms of separation, it seems that the act of distinction is just analytical. But when we follow the coming into being of distinction, the happening of distinction, we recognise that it must also be holistic because it intrinsically relates. The wholeness is already there in the act of distinction. Now this is something we would not have expected to find because we all think in terms of distinction as separating, analysing and so on. It doesn't occur to us that the act of distinction has a holistic aspect to it because there's an internal relating there in the very act of distinction. <coughs> <coughs> it may be helpful to find an image for this simultaneity of what seem to be opposites and those of you who have looked at the article I wrote in the Holistic Science Journal on the transformative potential of paradox will now recognise immediately <coughs> that what we're talking about now is another example of what I talk about there here we are in a situation which is paradoxical where opposites Differencing, relating, um, uh, an analytical, holistic, seem to be both present together. So we've got, uh, and again, we can use a little vice perspectival figure for this, but I'll change from the one I've been doing because I'm, it's time I exercise my ability to draw the duck rabbit <laughs> well if you look to the left it's a duck if you look to the right it's a very perky rabbit ok now there's only one there's only one diagram here and it is simultaneously duck and duck Look what I just said. <laughs> See how easy it is. I got it wrong. It is duck rabbit. It is not duck and rabbit. Because it were duck and rabbit, you have duck and rabbit. But you don't. You have duck, oh it's rabbit, oh it's duck, oh it's rabbit. You have duck slash rabbit. The duck is the rabbit, the rabbit is the duck. And that's the kind of picture we could have for differences relates. Differences relates is like this. Or analytic, no, no differences, analytic. And um, analytic, holistic. same. Analytic, holistic is in fact the same. Um, so as it's not duck and rabbit, but simultaneously duck rabbit, so the act of distinction is simultaneously the analytic, holistic act of differencing, relating. <coughs> if you reflect on this kind of thing, which I found terribly useful, you can see it's not a case of partly one and partly the other. 
but one which is simultaneously both, and they're opposites. So you discover here this extraordinary wholeness, and you do this by going back upstream to try to catch distinct distinction happening in the, the actual act, the appearing of the distinction, and try to see what happens in that instant when the distinction happens. And then you find the intrinsic relatedness and the holistic feature of distinction. And this extraordinary thing of a movement <coughs> of opposite, a dual movement, not two movements, but one movement which is dual, going in two different directions at once. In one direction, different thing, and the other direction, relating. Astonishing. And there it is. We can discover this by working our way into the experience. <coughs> so that's the quite what I call here yeah, for some reason. Put that later in mind. So I say the act of distinction differences place. It is a unitary act. Of, did I say of, did I say, which I'm being pedantic now, it's just for me as this. Yeah. Of brackets is one whole, different sink, relating. I've now changed the word to different sink to go with relating, because I want to really bring in the dynamics. It's an act of distinction, differences, relates. But now I want to say the act itself is an act of differencing, relating. Um, and it's unitary from the bracket round. It's one whole. It can't be separated. Okay. Now, quite a lot of this happens in... I should, I should explain. It's also said, so Heidegger said that there are as many phenomenologists as there are phenomenologists. So I'm doing it my way. So don't expect to find this way of doing it anywhere or other in a book which I might happen to write. But that doesn't mean I've made this up. This is it. But the way of doing it, the way of expressing it, is not something I can give a reference to in a book. <coughs> because this is the way I'm trying to bring it out. But if you understand it, anyone who understood phenomenology will look and say, yes, this is phenomenology, this, is, this, is, this does, does it. But other people wouldn't express it in this kind of way. Uh, the great advantage, I believe, I'm saying in my own defence, is that I'm a lot easier to understand than anyone else I've come across. That's, that's meant to be a joke. <laughs> yeah. That was a paradoxical statement, you see. Right. Have I got through that already? You're a good audience. You're an audience, good group. Have I, have I missed anything out? Have I done something wrong? <laughs> oh. I've done that. I don't think I'm very with it today, am I? I don't I can't even know what I've done and not done. Well, well, there we are. So, we're doing very well. Okay, now we take it a little bit further. What we've got is already something which is quite uh, important, quite significant enough. Now let's go to the next bit. The happening of distinction is the appearing of what is distinguished. Very important point. Remember, we're upstream all the time. It's the happening of distinction, and that is the appearing of what is distinguished. It is well known that when something is first distinguished, it soon appears to all who are able to see it, whereas previously it had not been seen by anyone. Even though, once it has been distinguished, we feel it was there to be seen all along, and we're astonished that nobody actually did see it. The medical or disorder of muscular dystrophy <coughs> provides an illustration of this. 
before the 1850s, when this disease was first described, that is distinguished by Duchenne, it had not been recognized by anyone. I emphasize that distinction, that description, <clears throat> when we describe, we distinguish. Description is an act of distinction. And this is how I got into all of this. Because in the middle of the 1960s, I was involved with a man called J.G. Bennett, who knew Schumacher, Schumacher, Bennett's job originally was the director of research for the British Coal Utilisation Research Council, and later that was a job that Schumacher had. Um, and I worked with Bennett uh, at an organisation he ran on on on. on uh, well, he was concerned with ways of describing time, um, which he felt were misleading. But it was generally on, concerned with how to describe experience in certain kinds of ways. It was phenomenology before I'd even come across phenomenology. Um, and because it was concerned with description, and this emphasis was on description, it really drew me into the question, well, what happens in describing? What? And that's when I realised that description is actually a distinction. And much later on, and I focused a lot on the whole idea of distinction, then much later on I found came across a form of mathematics by Spencer Brown, in which he constructed a whole calculus based on the notion of distinction. So I, just, I actually spent a lot of years, as it were, thinking about what is a distinction. But it came from working on describing, on description. You, you don't want to know that, but again, it's a bit of background because it isn't, this isn't just something I got up one morning and thought, oh, I know what today, I'll, I'll think today about uh, what happens when, in the act of distinction. It had a real motivation for me. So, Duchenne's discovery of muscular dystrophy when he described it was very interesting to me. But once distinguished, what had not been seen before began to be widely recognised. And by the 1860s, that's ten years later, many hundreds of cases of muscular dystrophy had been seen and described. <coughs> this prompted Charcot, the uh, psychologist, as someone already was, who, who was a teacher of Freud, to comment, how come that a disease so common, <coughs> so widespread, and so recognisable at a glance, a disease which has always existed. How come that is, it is only recognised now? Why did we need? Why did we need Monsieur Duchenne to open our eyes? Now this is a very important example, valuable example. I mean, because here we have something that was there for everyone to see and nobody saw it. Now. And once it was seen, people couldn't not see it. And then you couldn't understand why it was that people hadn't seen it before. Uh, the example I here I took from, um, it's in um, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat by the psychologist Sachs. Sachs. And Sachs describes some of his own experiences of this kind of thing. And it's very puzzling. Um, but we're actually it's very fundamental because being able to recognize it depends on the primary act of distinguishing <coughs> muscular dystrophy so that it stands out. What we later consider to have been there in front of us all the time is invisible to us before it is distinguished. We could say that the act of distinction bears it. We imagine, you see, it is there all the time. When we imagine that, we're thinking of it before, as if... <coughs> if we imagine it being there all the time, then we are thinking of it... <coughs> 
as it is after it's been distinguished, as if it was like that before it had been distinguished. And therefore, we put the cheese back into the milk. Because it's, when we think of it as being there, well, it's there, wasn't it? No, it's only there when it's distinguished. So we are putting the post-distinction phase back into the pre-distinction phase and saying, well, it was there already. But, so we should turn it round and say the act of distinction, there's it. Now it's there. When the act of there's it, now it's there. So when we focus on what is distinguished, it's there. When we focus on the distinguishing of what is distinguished, oh God, I'm mad. When we focus on the distinguishing of what is distinguished, that there's it. Then when we focus on what is distinguished, it's there. Can you follow that? Yes. It's dynamic. You have to think dynamically here. So you could say distinguishing is an act of creation? Ah, now that's what we have to go into, isn't it? That's a very good question because that's the next point we go to. Because the question then we have is, well, what on earth is going on here? Um, is Duchenne creating muscular dystrophy? That can't be true. Because obviously we now recognise that, well, muscular dystrophy was there, but nobody saw it. And yet we just said, well, it wasn't actually there until it was seen. But we can't suppose that we've uh, invented it or created it, and it's suddenly, poof, now there's muscular dystrophy when there wasn't before. <coughs> that can't be right. So you see, we're led here into a very puzzling situation. But the, the thing about, to, about this is that phenomenologically what you do is you try not to worry too much. Uh, you actually stick to trying to shift attention into the upstream, into the act itself, and then trying to say, see what that is. Stick to the phenomenon. Uh, Husserl used to have this phrase, um, we must return to the things themselves meaning you have to go back into the experience itself and follow that and trust it. So how does, what can we learn from this, which will answer your question, because it's a very, very real question. And this is what we need to do now. And this is certainly tricky. So we need to think about appearance. Or shall I go straight to that? Ramblings. Let's go straight to that. Can I... Uh, I I've got to answer this. Uh -huh. It's just connected with this. Yeah, it's just trying to, trying to uh, think of another example of uh, when something is distinguished, uh, how it uh, kind of gets offset. Um, do, do you remember those Magic Eye uh, uh, posters? that uh, you kind of stare at it for a while and it looks like it's just um, yeah it's a bunch of patterns abstract patterns and then suddenly after a couple of minutes something kind of pops out at you in three dimensions yes. so it's, it's not as if that wasn't there before but when you see it it, it becomes distinct and it's, there's a new set and series of relationships that develop between uh, well, I guess in the distinction, uh, there, there's some relationships that are created. Is that kind of... Yes, that's about? a very interesting example. Um, <laughs> if I look slightly puzzled, because I did look at these, I never managed on any single occasion to see one, <laughs> um, which I found extremely frustrating, <laughs> especially when everyone around me could do it, and that was a problem, yeah. Um, this, uh, but this does touch on the, the problem, as um, someone put it, the thing is... We don't exactly discover muscular dystrophy just there. But on the other hand, we don't make it up. We don't create it. Um, so somehow or other, we have a, a kind of thing here, uh, a kind of relationship, 
where it seems to be a kind of we discover it and at the same time create it. It seems to be both at the same time. So I think create, create is too strong a word. Um, but um, it'll do. But it'll do. Um, so this is not what we're used to. Because we say, well, either something is there and we discover it, or we, we find it, or we make it. It's, uh, or we create it, or whatever you want to say. So it's, it's either or. Oh dear, we're back in one of those paradoxical situations, aren't we? So now we find that this isn't. This is uh, both at the same time. It's a form of, of creation, and yet it, it's also a discovery. So this is something which people have tried to describe. And there's one. I. I, I um, there's one way of putting this which I quite like. Um, Do I do this now? Yeah. Okay, I'll do this now. So, uh, and this is from the Gilchrist book, um, which I just happened to spot the other day, uh, The Master and His Emissary, page 133. And he says, one way of putting this <coughs> is to say that we neither discover an objective reality nor invent a subjective reality. But that there is a process of responsive, evoca responsive evocation. The world calling forth something in me that in turn calls forth something in the world. The world calling forth something in me Something which in turn calls forth something in the world. So it's like this. Our relationship is actually like that. And if we put a, let's put world, oh, I don't know, me. I'll, I'll say me, it doesn't really matter. So, so. <coughs> that this, um, see, this muscular dystrophy is, is there but it's never been seen now Duchenne is obviously working on things and <coughs> he gets to the point <coughs> where it's as if that which in the world calls forth from him something so he, he, he recognises it and then what's in the world can actually appear. The key thing is appearing. It appears. And that is the, the, the big, the important notion that we have to go upstream all the time and focus on the appearance, the happening of the appearing. If we're thinking downstream in terms of what appears, we will never get this at all. But if you can just catch the appearing, it's in the appearing that the thing itself comes into being. Not comes into being metaphysically, out of nothing, but comes into being phenomenologically as appearing as what it is. And it hasn't appeared as what it is before. And that's the distinction. When it's distinguished, it appears as itself. It comes forth as itself and is seen. Which it has not been seen before. And that is, that is what, how the word, and that is called coming into being. And in phenomenology, that is what the word being means. You say that the muscular dystrophy has been released into being. It was there, but it hadn't come into being. And coming into being, it hadn't appeared. But when we think of it, take the word muscular dystrophy, we think of it in an appearing way already. See, I say muscular dystrophy was there. And you picture muscular dystrophy there. So you picture it to yourself appearingly before it had appeared. And this is the really hard part to get at. When you get upstream, this is what you find. When you have to really work through what does it really mean 
to be in the appearing itself. <coughs> With a bit of practice, <coughs> you discover that when you try to do this, you're importing appearance into the appearing. So, if, for example, one says, <coughs> it appears, that makes us think there's an it which appears. It appears. Oh, it appears. So the it was there before the appearing. Now, hang on a minute. When you think about that it, you think of it appearingly. So you think the it which is there appearingly now appears. Well, why should it bother? It's already appeared. Do you see the point I'm trying to get towards here? And it is difficult as this. We always put appearance into the appearing instead of seeing that the appearance comes from the appearing. So if we make that effort to get into the appearing, then we begin to see that something appears, it is coming into being, it doesn't suddenly start to exist out of nothing, it's not metaphysical in that sense, but it now bees, is what Heidegger calls it, it is, it, is, it, is, um, it is freed in order to be itself, but by appearing. And things are non-appearingly and then they come into appearance and then they are appearingly but when we think we imagine everything there without us appearingly well it can't be so what we discover here is that we are actually part of the equation here uh, because this kind of appearing happens with us we are the datives of manifestation the manifestation we are we're the receiving end of the manifestation <laughs> which could not manifest if we were not there so not subject object but human subjectivity turns out to have a much deeper significance than we perhaps realise not in the subjective sense but in the sense in which we all share that human subjectivity is the place where where where, where the world appears That's, that is what human subjectivity is the place where the world appears, where the world bees appearingly. But we imagine it being appearingly without us. That's a bad projection, is that? So this simple example is quite astonishing. Uh, it really is. Um, and we don't actually, uh, we don't create it. Um, well, we, that again, because there's, there are others too, I think. Uh, one way of putting this is to say that we neither discover an objective reality, that not, there's an object out there already, nor invent a subjective reality, project our ideas onto something, carve it out or create it or something else. But there is a process of responsive evocation. The world calling forth something in me that in turn calls forth something in the world. So there's something in the world which calls forth something in me, and that calls forth that in the world, which is calling forth something in me. That's that diagram there. That's it. I've said it. Even I, even I understood it that time. <laughs> I thought, well, yes, that's it. <laughs> Don't ask me to say that again. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> and this is, this replaces sort of epistemology, this kind of thing. It's much more subtle. And it, 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 there's no subject-object. What you get here, I was thinking about this sometime or other, I've got this paradox here, um, of what you've got is subjective objectivity and objective subjectivity. That probably doesn't help. But objective subjectivity means that subjectivity has something objective about it and subjective objectivity means the object actually takes place in the subject but something takes place in the subject which is objective yeah. and you just turn those around and that's what we actually have we have, we have that and so we are beyond we are, we're <laughs> then if you just focus on what is distinguished what happens it all collapses into object and subject separate. All what we're talking about collapses when you focus on what is distinguished. And that's when we're in the subject-object dichotomy. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when you go upstream, you find that you're no longer 
there at all. And it isn't and you can sort it out. And these questions come up, and that's exactly right. And you then follow them, but you you put them to the test in the light of the phenomenological experience. And you have to trust this process. And it might take a long time. But some of these things I'm talking about now, I must have I, I spent sort of years not not being able to get there. Yes. I wonder whether a very active language, the fact that as human beings that we have language, that we can actually abstract us from the, the present, the direct experience of the, of the present, and subtract ourselves into this um, other um, uh, way of being, which isn't, isn't being at the point of, of the... Um, the direct experience. In, in your article that we had to read, you mentioned there were two modes of consciousness, the receptive mode and the action mode, and it seems that from um, when we're in the receptive mode, I, I take from what you said in the article, is that we're actually in the, in the experience of experiencing. And when we're in the action mode, we're actually um, uh, abstracting ourselves from that mode, and then we're in this other mode where we're dealing with the um, what we've what we've created or what has been created through the, the language experience, mm. and it, it's quite. Um, I just wonder about our culturally whether or not there is a cultural differentiation there, or whether it's just a human phenomenon uh, that every human being who language, whether we all do this or whether it's um, whether, you can see this particularly as a medical practitioner and as like he's been brought up in a scientific tradition, there seems to be a belief that everything that, that, that nothing exists um, unless it's measurable that, that seems to be the tradition that I've my, my colleagues operate with um, whereas that seems to be a cultural uh, way of operating, not an intrinsically human way of operating, but, but maybe I'm wrong. No, uh, it... it... You want to say that... Um, well, of course, um, your colleagues operate in that way because this is, this is what they've got from the... Uh, from the culture that um, they're in. Um, we're all institutionalised and the institutions will give us that kind of thing and it, at the present time people are institutionalised in a way which emphasises measurement and quantity and so on and that and that, that is historically grounded. To, um, that This is a, a cultural historical phenomenon. Is that what you're saying? Because it certainly yes. is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, in, in this work that we're doing, you, you, what you say is, well, you have to put that on one side. I'm not criticising it, so I'm saying put it on one side. Um, we have to learn to go and experience in another way. Is it me or has the light gone funny in here? The, the sun just it could be my eyes, actually. Um, There's a lot of light on you. There's so a light on oh, you. Oh, God. Yeah. Off. Yeah. I thought I was getting, uh, getting no, migraine. No, I get... I get, I get auras. I, I, can, I couldn't see you properly. I thought, oh God, I'm getting an aura. So that's the end of today's session. Is that too dark now? Yeah. Oh. You yes. can put the lights on here. It's, actually, that's the answer. That's what's caused me the trouble. It's a relief for me. It may, may, may be no good for Is you. Yeah. 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 I get auras. Um, if, a, if a light flashes in my eye, and it's got worse than I've got older, I just get these auras, and I, I th thought it was migraine. But then I, people noticed I never got headaches afterwards. There is a condition where you get auras without getting headaches afterwards. It's, it's, um, it's, it is a migraine, it's called migraine phenomena. Is it? Oh, there you go. So I've got it. <laughs> well, that's what, I, that's what I've got. And when I was looking at you, I suddenly realised I couldn't see you properly. I thought, oh my God, no, don't tell me I'm starting with an aura. Because if I do that by the end of it, I won't be, you know, I can't. I can't. I think I'm, I'm all right. It's that light. That's what it does. It's it so, really yeah. Sorry to be so. I, I was doing that. I was thinking, I can't. What's happened? Yeah. 
Uh, you see, that's the trouble. You've got a more than half dead white European male here. You need to get someone who's dropping to bits as he speaks. You need to get someone younger doing this kind of thing. That's what you need to do. Mm. Yes. Uh, <laughs> preferably a woman, because that's the thing today. <laughs> Be a woman. Yes. Can I ask a question? Um, where you left off in subjective objectivity and objective subjectivity. Um, can we understand that to be a place where dualism arises? Well, well see, I think your dualism is, uh, <coughs> is overemphasized. Um, that this experience itself is non dualistic. Um, but people have got fixated on this, and poor old Descartes, they've had. They've uh, accused Descartes of this kind of dualism. Descartes didn't do anything of the kind, um, just as Newton was not a mechanical philosopher and so on. Yet they say, oh, mechanism comes from it doesn't. Um, the thing is that um, the subject-object dichotomy, which is that subject-object separation, is a natural consequence of the dynamics of experience. Because if you go from the, from the seeing of what is seen to, the folk, to what is seen, or from the distinguishing of what is distinguished to what is distinguished, you then focus on that as an object, then you have an object and a separate subject. So, and since that is the intrinsic direction of experience and cannot be avoided, as Merleau Ponty said, um, experience promotes its own self misunderstanding because it is, in fact, <coughs> centrifugal. It's always going out because the whole idea is. It, it, it's out, outwardly going, seeing the object it is the, the direction of experience is always outing away from itself and therefore the subject object separation or the subject object dichotomy is a consequence of the of the intrinsic directionality of experience and it happens automatically now that is important because this would have happened Supposing Descartes had never lived. Or supposing Descartes had lived and had been a fishmonger and not a philosopher. Would have made no difference to this whatsoever. So when people refer to this as Cartesian, uh, they're, they're, they're really barking up the wrong tree altogether. Because this doesn't come from Descartes. There is a dualism which comes from Descartes, which is a very specific dualism designed for a very specific purpose. And there is, therefore, a Cartesian dualism. But subject-object separation is not Cartesian dualism. Although, of course, Cartesian dualism does have the same form, but it's not that. And the, this, this dichotomy is built into our experience. So when you start to go upstream, you are going to move away from the subject-object separation to somewhere before pre-separation. And that's what we do. Now then you've got a problem about how to describe this. And this is what's happened to us, you see, because here, if we take this situation here, this, this fashion I think is very good, a process of responsive evocation, the world calling forth something in me that in turn calls forth something in the world. But it's that something in the world which calls forth something in me that which is called forth in me by that, then calls forth that in the world which is calling that forth in me. It's a wonderful, dynamic, dynamic reciprocation. And you can't break it down into subject and object because you're actually in a dynamic stage before that separation. And that's another thing. <coughs> whenever we get into this dynamic phase, we find that we are... Whenever we... we, we find, oh, sorry, okay. Whenever we get into the dynamic phase, we're before separation. When we get before separation, pre-separation, we find it's dynamic. <coughs> uh, something I wanted to say then has gone. I don't really know does it? it. It's absolutely extraordinary uh, how this works um, when you do this. And of course it's... Oh, what was it? Something I spotted. Oh, never mind. Oh, it's a minor point. Uh, uh, the late, later work of Merleau Ponty, he, he died of a heart attack at his desk, I think, in 1961. He was only 56. He was doing this extraordinary work. Uh, he, uh, he, he, he has this kind of dynamic, reciprocal interrelationship a lot. And it's built, actually, funnily enough, it's built on, on something in Husserl, in, in, in Husserl's 
philological investigations in 1900, 1901, and it's, it's a relationship which, which uh, Husserl calls the Fundierung model, in which he showed how there could be a relationship between the universe and the particular, which did not actually make the universal dominant on the particular dominate the particular. Uh, I, and they're, they're in a reciprocal interrelationship. Now this turns up in a lot of things. It's, it's in the work I did on the whole and the part, but I didn't know that. And it's only recently I've realised that all of this is right back in the very beginning, in a very obscure book by Husserl, but you'd never find it there. Murrow Ponty found it and used it and developed it, and didn't refer to that. And um, I just realised that one of the things, there's so much in European philosophy which is valuable, which we can, we're working with this now, for heaven's sake. We're actually working with Husserl's fundierum relation. If I directed you to what he says about this in the book, you, you wouldn't even recognise it. That's the problem. <coughs> Getting this stuff into a usable form <coughs> is a problem, and yet it's, it's very valuable. Look, look where we've got to here. And all we've been doing is considering the act of distinction. That's all we've done so far. Yeah. Are you describing the human experience? I just need to know, are animals having the same experience? And also, where does perception come into this? Well, I'm going to talk about perception later. Okay. Uh, but this is, of course, perception. Um, now, animals are obviously very difficult to, to deal with. Um, it's very hard. And... Um, It's, it's almost impossible to say something about this which would be right. Um, Are you wanting us to contain this to the human Well, uh, I'm not wanting you to do anything. Um, you must make your own choices. Mm. But what I would say is... Um, I find it easier to contain it to the human because that way we make certain discoveries about who we are. Which I think if we can get clear about we'd understand animals a lot better. And I think we tend to try to approach animals without first understanding something about ourselves that we need to understand first. Does that say, yes. it's not a cop-out, but you know. But there are some very interesting work being done by people who are becoming aware of this whole business of the animal world as being quite different to how it's being thought of. In phenomenology, it clearly it does have a contribution in there. There are people who are looking in, who are doing this. <coughs> Merleau Ponty got very interested in this. And he, well, uh, <coughs> he worked on the phenomenology of, phenomenology of perception. <coughs> he took he took the intentionality right into the body, and then it becomes an organic biological thing. There's only and conscious intentionality becomes only one species of intentionality, which opens the door. He's got he describes what happens when an insect has its legs tied together how it adjusts to that, and how it adjusts differently than, than it does when it loses one of its legs. And he gets a great deal out of describing those differences. And you can see the same kind of, he calls it motor intentionality, which is what we have, we live with it. But you have to go into, now you have to go into the, into, the, into the body as lived. Well, this is what people do, of course, this is terribly important. Um, and Murray Ponte did this in spades. But actually, the early, uh, Husserl does it. But it was in work of Husserl's that Merleau Ponty read in manuscript form, and he said so. But it, it didn't get published in English until 1990, so nobody knew that Husserl had done this. And so on. And anyway, it's difficult. It's difficult. But that you, you, but you have to try and do it and go into it, and and then try to try to find a way of doing it yourself as directly as possible, which is what I've been doing here. Um, just, is what you're describing different than the creation of awareness? Because, for example, if we, we come in this room and we're all sitting here, we've been sitting here for a few days, and I say, the, that map is crooked. And no one noticed that. But now every time we come in the room, everyone will know the map is crooked and be able to see that, whereas that wasn't in their perception yes. before. Is that, like, is that, are you talking about something different, or is Well, it's the same kind of thing, isn't it? Only in this case, something appears that has never appeared before. 
But it was my, like, it didn't appear to anyone else. It appeared to me because of what I saw in the world. Mm. And so it hadn't appeared before. Then. No, I agree. Yeah. But, uh, but there's a continuity between these, what you're saying and what I'm saying. Mm. But I think the extra thing is that um, it's true that that hadn't appeared before. And so that is an example... That is an example uh, of, of, of appearing and manifestation. So the, the map manifests crookedly, mm. you know. and so that is an appearance which someone. So this is a, this is an example, but in this case, um, it it, uh, it seems to be almost like there's, there's the maps have been there on walls before. Yeah. In this case, muscular dystrophy hadn't appeared at all before. But is it? Is, did he just draw our attention to muscular dystrophy? Dystrophy, and that that it was the creation of awareness was the creative. It, it certainly is the, like a creation of awareness. Yes, uh -huh. yes, uh -huh. yes, it is. Yes, that's right. With, with the muscular dystrophy thing, um, my sense of that is that it's it's a pattern of um, symptoms which meaning has been ascribed to, and whether or not. This whole this whole act of differentiation relating is actually a I guess an outcome of the ability of the human mind to ascribe meaning to perception and and that, that our our world as as human beings and probably non humans as well is created through that process of ascribing meaning to to patterns of perception, and certainly in, in, in the medical world, that's you know very much the case. Yes. Is, and and you know, as a medical practitioner, if I saw a case of muscular dystrophy, I'd recognise it. I doubt whether anybody else in yes, the room would have had yeah. experience with yes. it. So it, it's it's very much a what um, the meaning pattern complex that that. that, that that each of us carries around seems to be to be a necessary way of of actually recognising something. But but until that until we've actually um, or somebody has actually shared with us that meaning perception complex, then we we're not in the ability to to recognise. That's right. That. That's right. And the word meaning is a very good one. And I will come on to that. I would say briefly about perception. Because, uh, I, see, I think that's extremely interesting. Because, <clears throat> um, you said ascribe meaning. Uh, I would go further than that. I would say we don't ascribe meaning, we see meaning. We see meaning directly. I, I want to look into this, uh, not today, but tomorrow. Not a lot. I don't want to work where you are, this kind of thing. But we, again, there's a form of dualism here. There's this, and now we ascribe a meaning. You can actually go into the lived experience. You see, no, the meaning is direct; it's immediate. This is this is in um, this is uh, discussed a lot by the later Wittgenstein and by Heidegger and so on. And that this that we actually see meaning directly. Then, when we describe it, you have done so well. We then separate it and talk about whether well, it's out there, and then meaning it was ascribed to it as if it was there was two 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 aspects to it. But in the actual act itself, uh, there is a direct experience of meaning. That it, it's not the meaning of something, it's the meaning which is something. And that, uh, <coughs> that's the key to getting that. I, that's why I wanted to do some work on perception, on catching seeing in the act. Because I, I want to come to this, because I think it's so revolutionary, to get this right. Um, once again, we discover that we describe things in the downstream way, get ourselves into lots of puzzles which we can't ever solve. But if we go back upstream into the act, of see, catch seeing in the act, then we see there's no separation, and we're the ones who ascribe the sep ascribe, put the separation in by the way we describe it, and that's inevitable. So it's the difference again between lived experience and lived experience. So, I mean, that, what you're saying, as far as I'm concerned, is absolutely. Right on. Am I right on? Yeah. Um, before we finish then, uh, I, I, I want to, I'll, I'll just do a little bit more, I think. Shall I do a bit more? Yes, I shall do a bit more. 
Because I want to take another example, which I, I, it's, it's, I, I like this example. Well, I would do it if I could find the pages in which I've written it, but <coughs> this is an example. Oh, God. Ah, that's in the way. This is a sentence for you. The page 230 of the book I mentioned, in the Gilchrist book. The act of creation may be one of discovery, not in the modern, but in the older sense of finding something that was there, but required liberation into being. Hmm? Yeah. Where, where, where are you finding what? <laughs> It's it's in the Gilchrist book, but yes, downstairs. It's on page two hundred and thirty. Can we have it one more time? Yes, of course, can. The act of creation may be one of discovery, comma, not in the modern, but in the older sense of finding something that was there, comma, but required liberation into being. And McGill has been very influenced by Heidegger. This is pure Heidegger. Uh, that we, we actually free things to be. We must, he says, we must let beings be. We free things to be. And nobody can understand what he's talking about. But here you could say, Duchenne liberated muscular dystrophy into being. It doesn't mean he made it out of nothing. Not the metaphysical question, why is there something rather than nothing? In phenomenology, being is not metaphysical, it's phenomenological. Being, as Heidegger said, being is appearing. We always, in traditional philosophy, separate this being and appearance. In phenomenology, uh, appearance, but you have to go into upstream, into appearance. If you just deal with the appearance of something, in only sense, it'll, that's when there seems to be a separation. It'll all go wrong. You have to go upstream into the act itself, into the appearing. Then you can say that being is appearing. Appearing is being. It bees. That's what it is phenomenologically. In this case, muscular dystrophy bees. Didn't Michelangelo say a similar thing about uh, sculpture? Like bringing out, like freeing the sculpture that was in the stone. Yes, he did, and I suppose you could take that as a, as a as a an expression of this kind of thing. Yes, yes, that's right. It was when he created the statue of David. Yes, David. He said he chipped away everything that wasn't David, and then David showed up. David showed up. Yes, that's very good, that, isn't it? I'll just do this another example, I think, if I can do this. I don't know, I can't find... Uh, well, I can't find what I'm doing anymore. Oh, yes, I can. We could also describe the unitary act of differencing relating as an act of articulation. If something is articulated, it has clearly differentiated parts which are related. As someone who is articulate in speech is able to speak distinctly and coherently. Distinctly different, coherently relating. <coughs> when Goethe read a translation of Luke Howard's seminal essay on the modification of clouds, now uh, this I better say about that, Luke Howard was a man who spent a lot of time trying to unread, as it were, the clouds, trying to see if there were... what try to see what, what kind of, how to describe the clouds. I better not say any more than that. He said that Howard, this is Goethe, was the man who distinguished cloud from cloud. He introduced this, 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 these names, Cumulus, Cirrus, Stratus. And when we hear this, it seems to us so obviously just a bit of box standard classifying. Yeah, well, he looked at the clouds, didn't he? Uh, and he got and he said, well, well, let's go call that one Stratus, that one Cirrus, and that one Cumulus. Yeah, well, that's it, didn't he? Then just a bit of uh, just a bit of a uh, of a uh, um, classification external. He imposed this system on the clouds. How dreadful, and so on and that. But Howard spent years and years and years and years studying the clouds. 
and when he gave his eventual paper on it, um, uh, the people there were not expecting, they were astonished, people remembered, because, because a lot of people were trying to understand the clouds at that time, and they said, by God, he's done it, he, and Goethe got it straight away, he's distinguished cloud from cloud and thus also related them, because that was the problem, because they're not just sitting there, uh, cumulus, cirrus, stratus, they are for us, and, not, and what's more, these turn out to be dynamically related, that's the key, he got the dynamics from, from the observation, <coughs> because when the atmospheric conditions change, the cumulus changes into the cirrus, and if they change the other way, the cumulus changes into the stratus. So they're dynamically interrelated, it's not just... Um, um, as we would think it was today, um, um, an arbitrary imposed classification system. And Goethe realised, you see, this goes back to his whole idea of articulation. He wrote a poem in his honour in which he said, Howard had, quote, defined the doubtful, fixed its limit line and named it fitly. It may seem extraordinary to us today that Howard's simple classification of cloud formations, cirrus, cumulus, stratus, could be the source of so much scientific excitement and widespread admiration. <clears throat> At the time, it was quickly recognised that Howard had opened the door, which others had sought and failed to find, to the scientific study of meteorology. But now we would look upon this as if he'd done no more than impose a system of classification simply by applying labels externally to the superficial appearances of the clouds. <coughs> but this is because we begin downstream with the end result, the system of names. Instead of going upstream into the process of discovery to glimpse the coming into being of the distinction of which these names are the expression. How could anyone find a natural order in the ever-changing phenomena of the clouds? The very idea of finding anything fixed and constant in such fluid and impermanent phenomena seems at first absurd. Yet Howard was able to discern the hidden dynamics of the clouds and thereby distinguish three fundamental cloud types, which he said are as distinguishable from each other as a tree from a hill or a hill from a lake. He was able to show that the teeming myriads of cloud formations are all modifications of only three types, where we might have expected to find a multitude or even none at all. Three types forming and transforming into one another according to the atmospheric conditions. As Goethe and others recognised, Howard distinguished the cloud formations not in the sense of classifying them according to secondary characteristics, but in a unitary act of differencing relating in which the types are seen as simultaneously from and related to one another, so that they emerge in the distinction and they're, they're differenced and related in that distinction. Howard, we could say that in both senses, Howard articulated the clouds. Because, oh God, we could say that in both cases, Howard articulated the clouds because distinguishing and naming are two sides of the same coin, distinguishing and describing. This example shows clearly that the act of distinction is simultaneously analytic and holistic. It's simultaneously... See, I've got that wrong, haven't I? I said analytic and holistic, didn't I? Yeah. It should be analytic slash holistic. Mm -hmm. You see, I don't know what I'm talking about. <coughs> the, although, as we have seen, when we begin at the end, it seems to result in no more than a division into separate categories difference falls apart into separation. When we try to catch the distinction in the act, we find it is not divisive, but holistic. I read that badly, didn't I? Although, as we have seen, when we begin at the end, it seems to result in no more than a division into separate categories, difference falls apart into separation. When we try to catch distinction in the act, we find that it is not divisive, but holistic. Thus, when he distinguished cloud from cloud, Howard simultaneously revealed the dynamic wholeness of the phenomenon 
as Goethe recognized. Well, you can see there everything that I've talked about with the case of muscular dystrophy, the same thing. Here we have the appearing of the cloud formations, the appearing of the modification of the clouds. The whole clouds have always been there, but now they have come into appearance in this way, and therefore in that sense they've come into being. And he worked in this, he was a, he was a Goethean scientist without being a Goethean. There is a very nice book on this, incidentally, and uh, brings out, he was a real naturalist, and spent years and years looking at clouds, see. And so, it really it could be a case of something in the world evoked in him, something which expressed, evoked that which is in the world, which evoked that in him. And he's a living example of this in the way in which he worked. And this is a much more natural kind of science, you see. Very different from the quantitative measurement kind of science. Now, to finish off with here, I want to just introduce this distinction from Heidegger, which I find very useful um, and often referred to, um, and that is this uh, distinction, won't take long more, between <coughs> belonging together and belonging together. Not much of a distinction, huh? But if we do it like this, <coughs> Belonging together, belonging together. Heidegger distinguishes these two. Let's take the second one first. The, the together is emphasized. Belonging together. Here the togetherness is primary. And the belongingness is determined by the togetherness. So this is what happens when you bring things together. You together them and say, right, you belong because you have been together is what you do in systems theory you make things belong by togethering them so you make the belonging dependent on the fact that you have togethered them that's the system, the framework <clears throat> the other one is much more subtle here belonging is primary the belonging determines the together here it is that things already belong and therefore they are together because they belong together. The belongingness comes first. Now, if you don't notice this and you're crude, if you do belonging together where you're together things to make them belong, you may have completely overlooked the fact that in the natural order of things, they already belong together. You will, you will not even notice that and you will impose this system on that, thus hiding that so the way in which things already belong together will be obscured by what you do. And I believe that's what this kind of systems thinking and framework thinking does. When you see, and if you look at high, you see, some people might have thought that uh, Howard was working in this way, just sticking labels on clouds. But no, we see, it's not so at all. He actually saw the belonging together of the clouds. And his system of language, as Goethe recognized, re reflects the belonging together of the clouds. He doesn't make them belong together, which is how we would look at it as a system of labels. So this is really a very beautiful example. Uh, this is Heidegger's thing I find is terribly useful. And again, as you can guess... <laughs> This is what you get when you're downstream. When you go upstream, you begin to become aware of the belongingness which things already are. And that's the wholeness. It's there. That's the wholeness. That belongingness is the wholeness. But it's subtle. If you together things, that's the authentic wholeness. If you together things, you're downstream. That's counterfeit wholeness. That's the system. There's an awful lot in this distinction for Heidegger see it's wonderful uh, I mean I spent I, I mean I don't know the years. And what I find is that these things in philosophy you have to live with them it's like art you have to live with it and as you live with these things over the years and over the decades they begin to open up more and you begin to feel how subtle they are and how illuminating they are you, very simple things you have to just live with them and that's how you do philosophy 
But that's not how it's done, of course, in universities. You have to have a very, very good intellectual brain to be able to talk very rapidly and to beat down other people in logical arguments. <laughs> OK? Yeah. Anyway, I recommend that to you because I think it's a wonderful example that shows exactly what Howard was doing and the whole thing. Everything we've done today quite clearly now comes together as a whole. He said. <laughs> Well, if it doesn't, I'm off anyway, so it's fine, I suppose. Okay, folks.